During these Lenten devotionals, we have been exploring our need to repent, if you will, of sin writ large, those aspects of sin that transcend individual destructive acts. One aspect of coming to grips with this systemic nature of sin is realizing that sometimes sin is not evil to its core. Sometimes sin is the corruption of one of God's good gifts to us. When we fail to see that good gift has been corrupted, however, it can become a form of sin that clings especially close to us. It is to an example of such a sin that I draw our attention this week as I invite you to consider our need to repent of the sin of Christian nationalism. It's not unusual for people within the church, upon hearing the phrase, the sin of Christian nationalism, to react with either surprise, confusion, or even resistance. How can something that is Christian be a sin? Well, it can be if, as I just suggested, we have corrupted something that was good. So, it's important that we begin by reflecting on the role of nations as viewed from the vantage point of Reformed theology as one of God's good gifts to us. In Genesis, we encounter nations first in the listing of the descendants of Noah's son in chapter 10. Each portion of those genealogies ends with a refrain noting the diversity of these descendants by their families, their languages, their lands, and their nations. This diversity is presented as a gift from God, and the divine intention for such diversity among peoples, languages, and nations across the world is reinforced by the story about the Tower of Babel that immediately follows in chapter 11. Alongside this diversity, another of God's gifts relating to nations is their potential to promote good and just societies for those who recognize that role. As we read in 1 Peter, For the Lord's sake, accept the authority of every human institution, whether of the emperor as supreme, or of governors as sent by God to punish those who do wrong, and to praise those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing right you should silence the ignorance of the foolish. As servants of God, live as free people, yet do not use your freedom as a pretext for evil. Honor everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. There are several things to note in this passage, and one significant thing to draw from its context. The role of governments is both to restrain destructive behavior and to promote what is good. Those who are within the church have separate responsibilities, both as free people who are citizens and also as God's servants, whose ultimate allegiance and accountability is to God. As Paul writes in Romans, there is no authority except from God, and so even those civil authorities that exist have been instituted by God and ultimately are accountable to God for the powers entrusted to them. But notice that these calls for deference to national authorities were written when the church's relationship to Rome was not one which would have naturally given rise to a desire to honor the emperor, the governments in some localities in this period exhibited open hostility toward Christ's followers. Christians were called to be good citizens because they are disciples, not because they are favored by the state. As we know, the relationship between the church and the Roman Empire did not forever remain one of hostility. Without sorting through all the historical and legendary bits, we know that Constantine and the Church would become partners in the exercise of imperial power. Disentangling this intertwined relationship of Church and State was one of the things that the Reformers sought to change. Within the Westminster Confession of Faith, they made clear that God is the Supreme Lord and King of all the world, and that God had placed many magistrates to be under God over the people. While it was lawful for Christians to accept and execute the office of a magistrate, they were to exercise their authorities according to the wholesome laws of each commonwealth. 
they should manifest Christian virtues of piety, justice, and peace, but they were not in their roles as magistrates to assume to themselves the administration of the word and sacraments, which is the proper realm of the church. There is no clearer example of the sin that can arise from the corruption of Christian nationalism than the union that was formed between the German Christians and the National Socialist Party, or Nazis, in the last century. In the Theological Declaration of Barman, Reformed and Lutheran pastors and theologians reaffirm the principles of Scripture and the Westminster Confession. Because God is sovereign over all things, they rejected the false doctrine as though there were areas of our life in which we would not belong to Jesus Christ, but to other lords. Because Christ is the Lord of the church, they rejected the false doctrine as though the church were permitted to abandon the form of its message to changes in prevailing ideological and political convictions. Because God has established the roles for both the church and the state, they rejected the false doctrine as though the state should become the single and totalitarian order of human life, and they rejected that the church could appropriate the characteristics, the tasks, and the dignity of the state. Earlier this year, my brother sent me a text message to ask whether I had seen the Jesus Saves, the Jesus 2020, and the Jesus is my Savior and Trump is my President banners that were being carried by some of the rioters on Capitol Hill. I responded that I had never thought I would see the day when there would be blatant demonstration here in the United States of a Reichskirche, a purpose and intent to unite a particular expression of Christianity with the drive by a particular politician or party to seize power. But I must confess that was only a failure of imagination, or perhaps more likely an unwillingness to see what has been growing in plain sight over the decades of my adult life. To assert that the United States is in some unique way a Christian nation is to deny that God is sovereign over all families, lands, and nations. To assert that only those who profess to be Christian have a place in civic authority is to deny the scriptural truth that God has not left the divine self without a witness in doing good within all nations. To corrupt God's gracious gift of society and governance into a will to power for only Christians is a manifestation of the systemic power of sin to corrupt even God's good gifts, a power for which we must repent. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Redeemer, in our weakness we have failed to be your messengers of forgiveness and hope. Renew us by your Holy Spirit, that we may follow your commands and proclaim your reign of love. High God, Holy God, you rule the ways of peoples and govern every earthly government. Guide all nations into your ways of justice and truth. Establish among us that peace which is the fruit of righteousness, that your reign may be known here as in heaven. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.